let me go ahead and uh, introduce our speaker. So for the second month in a row, um, we'll actually be having a presentation on uh, focusing on killer whales. Uh, tonight's presentation focuses on um, echolocation behavior of fish-eating killer whales uh, during pursuit and capture of salmon prey. Our speaker is Ms. Brianna Wright. Brianna um, has paper is based on part of her master's degree, uh, which she obtained in zoology at the University of British Columbia. Under the supervisions of um, certainly well, anyone who's read about uh, killer whales know of Dr. John Ford's uh, longstanding work on that and uh, Andrew Trice as well. Um, currently, Brianna works as a marine mammal biologist with Fisheries and Oceans uh, Canada, where she's assisting with photo ID work, uh, distance sampling surveys, and conduct spatial modeling to assess the distribution and abundance of cetaceans in British Columbia. She's also working on projects to examine killer whale diet in uh, British, Columbia, uh, uh, British Columbia waters. Sorry about that. Uh, I just also wanted to comment, this is the second month in a row in which uh, the presentation has been based on student work. Um, and I think this is a really good indication of the high quality work that we see students working in marine mammal science um, do. So it's, it's nice again to have a paper based on student work. So the paper in marine mammal science is called Behavioral Context of Echolocation and Prey Handling Sounds Produced by Killer Whales During Pursuit and Capture of Pacific Salmon. Brianna's co-authors are Volker Deek, Graham Ellis, Andrew Trites, and John Ford. Um, so with that, I think, uh, well, uh, let me just point out that I've put a link in the chat to uh, Brianna's paper. It is an open access paper, so it's available all the time, um, whether you're a member uh, or not of the society. So uh, you have access to it any time. So with that, I think I will turn it over to Brianna to tell us what she's gonna tell us tonight. Brianna. Awesome, thank you, Daryl. Um, hope everyone can hear me and thanks for taking time out of your day uh, to come to this talk. Um, Daryl did a great job of uh, introducing my co-authors, so I just want to acknowledge their uh, contributions to this work and to the success of my master's thesis, but I'll just get right to it. Um, so this is the title of the paper, which Daryl already introduced, but this work is, uh, was undertaken by Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and as part of my master's thesis, I was lucky enough to, to participate in it and, and get access to a great data set. Um, to get my degree. And most of our work at DFO on the Pacific, uh, it's all coastal British Columbia. So you can see sort of the locations we work on the map there. But this specific study um, took place in a very regional location um, off the Northeast end of Vancouver Island, right here where the star is. And that location we picked uh, purposely because it's a location where killer whales reliably return every year to feed on Pacific salmon and large uh, numbers of Pacific salmon have to migrate through that area uh, when they return to the Fraser River to spawn every fall. And the tool we use to examine how these whales use echolocation while they're foraging is uh, the D-tag, which some people are probably familiar with. It's a suction cup attached uh, tag that produces extremely high resolution um, short-term data, so on the order of a few hours to a day worth of information. So before I hop into the details of my study, just for people who aren't specifically familiar with um, killer whales in British Columbia, we actually have three different ecotypes. So ecotypes are uh, unique populations of killer whales that differ in their diet, they differ in their social organization, um, and they also don't interbreed with one another, and they also differ acoustically. So they're very different. Um, groups and can be visually distinguished, acoustically distinguished. Um, but one of the most interesting parts about ecotypes uh, for me is that their, their diets are very different. So on the top here, 
Um, we have the resident killer whales. There are two populations in BC, the northern residents, which are the ones I'm going to talk about today, and then also the endangered southern resident killer whales, um, which uh, frequent southern BC and also Washington state and the uh, western seaboard of the United States. So people may be more familiar with uh, southern residents, but today we're going to talk about northerns. Um, and then the other ecotypes are the bigs or transient killer whales, which are the marine mammal eaters, and the very infrequently encountered offshore killer whales, which feed on sharks and uh, some species of bony fish. So at Fisheries and Oceans, we've been studying uh, killer whale diet for many years. Um, we do this primarily by um, collecting pieces uh, of leftover prey fragments, such as scales and fish tissue um, from the water column after we observe killer whales making a kill. And then these pieces can be submitted to either uh, scale morphology labs, so they can be aged much in the way that you would age tree rings and the species can be identified or they can be identified uh, via genetic techniques. So just to give an overview of the breadth of diet data that DFO has collected over the years, um, this is a summary of a study that we uh, did back in 2010, looking at over 30 years of, of diet information, over 900 different feeding events. And basically what all these data show is that um, resident killer whales primarily feed on salmon. So over 95% of the prey that could be identified to species were salmonids, and that overwhelmingly they, they seem to prefer um, Chinook. So over 70% of those salmonids that were identified ended up being Chinook. And you can see the distribution on the right of, of uh, how that breaks down kind of on a regional basis in BC. And there are some fairly consistent patterns there. Chum is sort of of secondary importance, especially in the fall. Um, but generally it's Chinook um, and the whales have a preference for the larger age classes. So the four and five-year-old fish, these are the biggest fish, uh, they're the fattiest and they have the best uh, energetic return. So now that we've talked a bit about diet, so you have a little bit of background information, I'm going to jump into talking about echolocation uh, of these animals. So pretty much as long as scientists have been studying uh, whales and toothed whales and dolphins, um, they've been looking at echolocation clicks that these animals produce and, and have kind of figured out that these are sounds that aid in navigation and they aid, aid in foraging uh, functions. So beginning in the 1950s, people were looking at captive animals, giving them target detection tasks or target discrimination tasks, and often uh, restricting their vision at the same time to see how echolocation uh, allowed them to, to find and hone in on, on targets. And the picture here uh, that you see is um, some early work with one of the first captive killer whales, Moby Doll, in Vancouver, and some of the first recordings of echolocation um, from individual killer whale came from him. And so through this work, scientists were able to determine that click intervals, so the, the interval time between clicks correlates with the target range. So the, the two-way travel time, so it takes a certain amount of time for the click emitted from the killer whale to reach the intended target, then to return to the killer whale, and then a little microsecond of time for that whale to process that signal in its brain and then emit another click. Um, so we know that click intervals correlate with target range. And this is really important because toothed whales are also emit really rapid click sequences. And these are called buzzes and they're thought to function in prey targeting during the final moments leading up to prey capture. So as the animals are honing in on that target, getting closer and closer and closer, the click sequences become very close together. So more recently, we've had advances in technology in the last 20 years or so that have produced the ability to attach a recording device to the animal itself rather than um, putting a hydrophone in the water. So you can get very high resolution um, acoustic data um, to look at echolocation behavior in a wild individual um, rather than restricting it to a kind of artificial captive situation. And there's a great body of literature out there, especially for uh, deep diving cetaceans like beaked whales, sperm whales, um, and also some interesting stuff uh, coming out of NOAA um, 
by Marla Holt and Jenny Tennyson. So I encourage people to look that up because that's um, some great work on Southern resident killer whales in that location using this type of acoustic tag. So before we were able to use tags, um, a lot of acoustic studies on killer whales looked at echolocation activity by going out on the water, um, deploying a hydrophone over the side of the boat and observing what groups of animals were doing. And this provided vital information that showed that when resident killer whales were exhibiting foraging behavior, their echolocation activity actually increased. Um, work by uh, Volker Deek and also by Lance Barrett Leonard showed that resident killer whales produce louder and more variable echolocation clicks than the big or mammal eating ecotype. And they also echolocate more often than that ecotype. So there's something pretty important about echolocation and how this ecotype of killer whale uses it to find fish. And other work with hydrophone arrays looked at the click properties uh, that resident killer whales were actually producing and determined mathematically that these animals could probably detect prey at distances of about 100 meters or more, and that they can actually use echolocation to distinguish between different sizes of fish, but also potentially different species. Um, the, the studies that did this looked at uh, backscatter off of the swim bladders of these uh, fish. So other than the intense scientific curiosity in what these animals are doing uh, with their echolocation while they're foraging, why does it matter? Um, one of the main reasons is that we know that these populations are small and that they face a lot of anthropogenic threats um, to their continued growth. Um, and on, on the left here, you'll see a sort of pathways of effects flowchart. And this is out of a really great, very, very recent study um, by a colleague at DFO, Catherine Clark Murray, and she looked at um, modeling of cumulative impacts of different threats to resident killer whales. Um, so for example, um, one that we've known about for a while, uh, looked at Chinook abundance and how does this impact killer whale mortality? And this was work that John Ford did, um, showing that mortality actually increases uh, the lower the abundance index for Chinook is. Um, we also know that these animals are exposed to a lot of disturbance from vessel noise. Um, and this could have a really detrimental impact on how effective echolocation is for them and, and in which, I guess, the efficiency of it and, and how, how able they are to capture prey uh, in the presence of different types of noises and different loud, loudnesses of noises. Um, so this interaction between the abundance of prey and the potential disturbance of that foraging efficiency is a little less clear and it, it hasn't really been fully quantified yet what, what that impact is. So that's one, one main reason of trying to get a good idea of what baseline echolocation looks like um, for these animals to see then in turn what kind of impact vessel noise might have on it. So like I said before, uh, the tool we used for the study was uh, called the D-tag, developed out of Woods Hole. Um, and these tags are, are really great. They're a suction cup attached tag, so they're fairly low impact and they produce very high resolution data. So the, the, the tag sensors are taking samples many, many, many times per second. So you get very clear idea of what's actually happening. And um, for that reason, they are also short term. So they are only attached to the animal for a few hours up to maybe a full day if you're lucky. So a few of the sensors that this tag includes is a pressure sensor. So we know how deep the animal is in the water column. They also have a set of triaxial accelerometers and magnetometers. So these are sensors that tell us the body orientation of the whale. Um, so is it upside down, right side up? Um, and also it's acceleration on three axes. So these are kind of similar. This is a souped up version of what's in your cell phone. So when you tilt your cell phone screen and your cell phone knows whether you're in portrait mode or landscape mode, this is kind of a similar type of device. And then finally, it has two hydrophones. So this is the main like powerful part of, of this tag is that we can get simultaneous movement along with sound. Um, and this picks up all the sound in the environment from the whale's point of view, which is pretty neat. 
So I'm gonna play a few sounds, hopefully they're not too loud, but maybe people turn down their volume if they're worried about it and they're wearing headphones. So you can get sounds that the, the tag whale itself makes, like those echolocation clicks. You also pick up sounds from other members. Resident killer whales are very vocal species and they're usually in, in larger groups. So you get a lot of sounds from um, surrounding whales. And then you get all the sounds from the environment. And this can include sounds that we may have an interest in measuring, um, such as sounds from vessels. So that was just a sound from a small uh, motor vessel that we picked up on one of our DTAG recordings. So it'll give you an idea of what the whales hear underwater when a boat like that goes by. So in terms of field data collection, these tags are attached using a carbon fiber pole. So you can see uh, Mike, our expert tagger on the front of the boat there, um, about to deploy this tag on a male uh, killer whale. And we were able to get 31 uh, deployments of these tags for over 120 hours of data. Um, and all of these deployments uh, took place in August and September um, in the years 2009 to 2012. On the right, you can see all the tag tracks that we were able to collect. So these are the paths that all the tagged animals took uh, through that Northeast Vancouver Island uh, area. And then from all these tag tracks, we tried to find instances where we were able to collect those prey fragments or prey samples at the surface and confirm that the animal indeed made uh, a foraging catch of a salmon. Um, so we were only able to get 17 of these. Um, but with these events, we could look in great detail of, at the uh, echolocation patterns and the movement. So the 17 prey captures that we uh, were able to, to get came from seven different deployments, three on males, uh, three on females, and one on a juvenile of unknown sex. And these represented nine Chinook captures, six Chum, and two Coho. So in terms of what we needed to do to look at the echolocation pattern of the tagged whale, um, the first thing you need to do is sift out um, the echolocation of the tagged whale from all the echolocation clicks made by all the other animals around it. Um, and there's a couple of different methods for doing this. Um, so we applied them both in kind of a tiered uh, methodology. So the first one is to look for low frequency energy um, in the clicks themselves. So because the clicks from the tag whale will have to pass through its tissue before it reaches the tag hydrophones, you get uh, low frequency energy in the clicks. So you can see on the spectrogram here, the clicks I've marked with an A, you can see they have quite a bit of energy in the zero to 10 kilohertz uh, portion, whereas fainter clicks behind them don't have that. And so that's one way you can, you can discern focal and non-focal animals. And then also I was lucky enough to uh, get access to some MATLAB routines um, from a colleague at NOAA, Marla Holt. And these uh, are sort of a more quantitative way of, of looking at um, which clicks are focal and which are not. And this uses angle of arrival. So the principle here is that uh, clicks from the tagged whale will always arrive at the hydrophone from the same angle because the tag is attached to the whale's body versus clicks from an untagged whale are gonna change in the angle that they arrive at the hydrophone. So they'll fluctuate as that non-focal animal moves relative to the tag. So once we've done that, uh, we marked all the clicks and calculated the interval between them so we could tell the clicking rate. And we also used the interclick intervals to assign clicks into bouts or trains. Um, and we defined this as uh, any clicks that uh, were separated by intervals of less than two seconds were part of the same click train or bout. Uh, the acoustic records for all 17 of the prey captures were also binned, so I chopped them up into one second intervals and uh, measured the echolocation rate in terms of clicks per second for each of those bins. The next thing I needed to do was to take a look at how echolocation changed um, prior to the whale catching the fish versus after. So we had to pinpoint that moment uh, in which the whale was capturing the fish in order to separate those two phases of a foraging dive. 
Um, so we used the kinematic data from the tag uh, to pinpoint this. So you'll see on this image that uh, the whale engages in some fairly obvious chase looking behavior where it's twisting and turning and um, changing its direction rapidly. And then all of a sudden that stops and it goes straight back up to the surface. Um, so that's what we use to kind of make that estimation that uh, that's probably the moment that they caught the fish. And once they have a fish, there's no real point in staying down there. Might as well get back up to the surface, offload your CO2, restore your oxygen stores and eat the fish. Um, and we corroborated this by going into the acoustic records and, and looking at changes in flow noise. So at that moment of capture, you'd often hear sudden deceleration of the animal and then you'd hear the fluke strokes as it went back up to the surface again. Um, so this allowed us to, again, as I said, divide those dives into a, a pre-capture pre phase and a post-capture phase so that we could compare the echolocation behavior between the two. So what did we find? Um, so during search and pursuit, so the pre-capture phase before the fish was caught, we found that uh, northern resident killer whales spend a, a greater proportion of their dive time actually engaging in echolocation, which makes sense, and also that they're emitting clicks at a much greater rate. So they're uh, click repetition rates are higher. Um, so you can see on the left here, um, a median of about 34% of their time was spent uh, engaged in echolocation before they caught the fish, but then it dropped to less than 4% once they had the fish. Um, and then the click rate similarly dropped from more than four clicks a second often to almost none. And we did indeed detect buzzes, so these rapid uh, click sequences that are produced during extremely close approaches that have been seen in pilot whales and beaked whales and other, other species on which these type of tags have been um, deployed. And so in that final moment when the, when the whale is getting very, very close to the fish, uh, rapid updates on prey movements are, are really necessary for them to um, make that capture. So we defined a buzz uh, for these animals as click trains that contained at least uh, one interclick interval that was less than or equal to 10 milliseconds. So these are very close together. And you can see from the spectrogram on the bottom that the vertical lines of the clicks become so tight together that they're, they almost look fused into one sound. Um, and I will I'll play you one of these. I'll just turn up my volume here because this one's a bit quieter. So it sort of sounds like a zipper <laughs> being done up. Um, and these buzzes were present in most of the prey captures. So 12 out of 17 uh, for a median of around one per capture, although some captures had more and some captures had none. Um, and they last about five seconds on average. Oh, let's hear it one more time. <laughs> um, so when we looked at where buzzes happened in a dive, so were they in that pre-capture phase or were they in the post-capture phase? Um, you'll see in this figure, if you look along the bottom, you'll see time um, and time in the negative is all the time leading up to the capture and time in the positive is all the time after the capture and the dotted line represents the moment of capture for each animal. So you'll see that a lot of these buzzes um, happened prior to the prey actually being captured, which is what we'd expect given their function or their presumed function. And they tended to occur in deep water. So median depth was over 120 meters, um, but often down to 200 plus meters, these would happen. Um, and this is consistent with uh, earlier work we did with the D-tags that shows that salmon appear to dive in response to pursuit by killer whales. So the killer whale will detect a salmon somewhere in the water column that's a little uh, shallower. And then during the pursuit, that salmon will dive and these animals have to pursue it to depth before eventually capturing it at a deeper location. We did detect a couple of instances where we heard a buzz after a capture had occurred, and these could represent perhaps an escaped fish, so one that had been grabbed onto and then had to be um, kind of recaught, uh, but they could also be used for navigation, and that's been shown in some porpoise species that they'll emit buzzes after they've actually caught prey, and that's thought to aid them in navigating back to the surface. When we broke down uh, echolocation patterns by prey species, we found a few different things. Um, one was that clicking began at comparatively shallow depths, no matter what species was being pursued. Um, 
So these animals, uh, a lot of the time you think, well, maybe they're only engaging in echolocation when vision is restricted and they're in deep water where they can't see anything, but that really wasn't the case. Um, a lot of the time they were echolocating um, at depths where they could actually see stuff too. So I think that vision and echolocation are kind of, are acting together um, to facilitate prey capture. We did see a slight difference in that the Chinook captures, the first echolocation click that the whales would um, produce was a little bit deeper. So it was around 20 meters versus 10 meters for the other two species. So that checks out with what we know um, about where Chinook hang out in the water column. And also that buzzes for Chinook captures were also deeper. So by the time the whale got to the point of buzzing, if they were chasing a Chinook, it was usually quite a bit deeper than, than Chum. And so these differences are consistent with what we know about how these different species of salmon use the habitat and, and also with that predator avoidance response of, of fish diving um, when they're um, being chased by a killer whale. And this graph just shows um, some data compiled from various salmon tagging studies that shows kind of the mean swimming depths of different species and um, showing that Chinook are generally in this kind of 40 meter, 50 meter range um, when they're just swimming along doing their thing. Um, and all the other species are, are more at the surface. And the other sound we sort of discovered was prey handling sounds. Um, and that was somewhat unexpected. Um, my co-author Volker Deek did some really cool work on transients um, when they're killing prey and the, the ramming sounds and the, the ripping sounds that they make um, when they tear apart seals and sea lions are, are pretty spectacular. And I didn't really expect to hear sounds like that with residents because their prey is so small compared to their body size. And, it really is only um, you know, one animal chasing one prey at a time. Um, but we did actually hear crunching and tearing noises and they were present in most of, of the prey captures that we looked at and usually several of them. And we think this is uh, noises that come from when whales are tearing apart salmon. So they, they usually tend to process salmon rather than swallow it whole. They will break it apart into pieces, even small ones. Um, and sometimes they eat those themselves, but sometimes they also share them with other individuals in their group. So some of the prey handling noises could come from prey sharing, like close by uh, animals also processing parts of that prey. And we validated this using underwater video. So we had some pole camera footage um, that shows animals processing prey, and we hear the same sounds associated with as we did on the DTAG. And the spectrogram just shows uh, what those sounds look like. They're kind of subtle. Um, hard, they sort of look like background noise, but when you hear them, they're fairly distinct. You kind of develop an ear for it. So I'll just play one of those. So it just sounds like someone kind of biting into a sandwich probably is the best analogy I could come up with. I'll play it one more time. I have a better recording uh, to follow. So when did prey handling sounds occur? Um, again, looking at uh, time since salmon capture, so the negative, negative times are leading up to the capture and the positive times are after. Um, we primarily saw these happening after the capture and happening near the surface, which checks out with what we know about um, killer whales from the kinematics on these tags that once that chasing behavior stops and they've caught the fish, they tend to go right back up to the surface. Um, immediately. And then they, we see the, from service observations that they are, you know, circling around and, and breaking apart fish. And this is all uh, stuff that's been observed for years from the surface. So it, it uh, kind of, this data kind of corroborated what we've been seeing. Um, so the, the median depth of these sounds uh, was about um, 11 meters, so pretty shallow. And again, it, it coincided with all our surface observations of salmon being broken apart, um, shared with other animals. Um, we have a couple of detections of sounds like this uh, prior to capture, which is a little interesting. I think the ones um, that are right at the zero mark, right around the time of capture could represent um, when the, the whale actually closes its jaws around the fish, or it could represent potentially an escaped fish that had to be grabbed again. Um, but they could also potentially be identification errors um, because some of these sounds are, are pretty subtle and 
and uh, can sound similar to flow noise inside the tag housing and things like that. So just to bring this all together, um, this is an example of one of these events that shows um, both movement and sound components plotted together. And I'll also play, play a portion of this uh, dive. So you can see on the top panel um, that there's a time depth profile for this dive and a 3D representation to the right. Um, so all of that surface uh, activity was actually done in a tight little knot. Um, and then I've marked out in black uh, the times when the whale was actually echolocating and the gray bars uh, through those black lines uh, show when those echolocation uh, trains were actually buzz trains. Um, and then I've divided it into pre-capture and post-capture phases with the red line. And you can also see in the blue, the pre-handling sound. So it gives like an overall picture of what this dive looks like acoustically and also what it looks like um, in terms of movement. And if we go to these lower panels here, um, you can actually see the clicking rate um, over time and how it changes after the capture has been made. And also the body roll. So a mark of zero on body roll is an upright whale that's swimming in a normal position and 180 is upside down. So you can see kind of how that changes over time um, and differences between the pre-capture where there's a lot of rolling and a lot of upside down body positions versus the post-capture that's a lot more sedate. Um, and then the bottom is a measure of pointing angle. So pointing angle is just a, a metric uh, to tell you sort of where the long axis of the whale is pointing. So spikes in this indicate that the whale is changing its body uh, pointing angle a lot um, versus after a capture that doesn't happen as much. So I'll just play a short clip so people can hear what this dive sounds like. So the clip is just the last part um, that goes kind of deeper to 80 meters and then comes up again so you can hear the, the prey handling sounds. Um, and you'll also hear things like uh, fluke strokes. So you hear rushing water and you'll hear when the whale is accelerating, you hear fluke strokes happening. So I'll just play this. You hear some echolocation there. more clear echolocation. There's a buzz, <laughs> hard to hear. More buzzing. Now you hear the rushing of the quick strokes as the whale is accelerating back up towards the surface. Squill of excitement. <laughs> and then here's the prey processing. Awesome. So hopefully that gives you guys an idea of, of what this actually sounds like underwater and, and the process the animal's going through. Um, and then just to sum up a few kind of limitations of, of this work and, and some conclusions. Um, so our analysis was limited to daytime foraging only because we needed to uh, collect those prey samples and confirm true positive kills. So we didn't do anything um, at nighttime and potentially echolocation could be used differently at night, we don't know. Um, it was also limited to a single season. So it's late summer, early fall um, for kind of logistic and weather reasons. And then also only one region. So this is a kind of a prime foraging region for Northern resident killer whales, but behavior could differ um, in other regions under different acoustic conditions. 
And also keep in mind that this is a small sample, it's 17 events. Um, so it's, it's somewhat limited in that way, but it also, because it was a small sample, it allowed me to go through and manually analyze everything in extreme detail. So it took a really long time to go through these events, um, even though they're only several minutes a piece, um, but uh, it just gave us a really detailed picture. So in conclusion, we use the DTAG data to link the echolocation patterns of northern resident killer whales with their diving behavior during verified prey captures. Um, we were able to confirm that the echolocation patterns they produced um, are consistent with prey detection and tracking functions, as is found for other species. And we were also able to identify a couple of acoustic markers um, for capture attempts, so buzzes, and capture successes, the prey handling sounds. So in the future, this could potentially be useful in estimating um, foraging efficiency, although we have to be careful because um, as I presented, these don't occur in a one-to-one -one kind of ratio. So you have to kind of have that kinematic data uh, to back it up and be able to um, really get to the details of, of how many captures are actually going on. And yeah, in conclusion, I'd just like to thank uh, all of these people who contributed to the study in some way, and um, also uh, Daryl and the student members at large and Teresa for, for inviting me. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that uh, great presentation. Um, I, I actually enjoyed very much your uh, vocal components for um, uh, hearing the animals at work. Um, maybe I'm going to start off the questioning and just ask you, um, so you had these, uh, I forget what the exact number was, uh, seven um, cases where you actually had uh, the species being uh, pursued and, and captured. Um, did you by any chance try looking at differences in parameters, um, click parameters and so forth? Um, or, or orientation parameters uh, when with these different uh, salmon categories? Uh, not specifically. I mean, we looked at um, the, just the depth of where that first click train in, in a sort of a hunting chase happened. And um, that was deeper for Chinook, but shallower for the other species. Um, and we did look at the buzz depth. But other than that, I, I didn't have time to to go into click properties or um, that kind of thing. It just, it would, would have taken too long. And I, it's also not my area of expertise, um, the, the physics of, of the acoustics itself, so. Okay. Um, all right, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Teresa to pick up on the questions that are coming in uh, in the Q&A. Great, thank you, Daryl, and thank you, Brandon. That was fantastic, really cool. Um, so we have one from Facebook that I'll actually start with first, which is, um, do you know if the orcas tend to share smaller prey items? So like less than five kilogram fish, or like is there a range in when, when that sharing behavior occurs? Sharing seems to happen regardless of size. So um, a lot of the smaller age class fish, so if, it, if a fish is caught that's younger, it'll be smaller than a, a bigger one. Um, it's been seen that sharing occurs regardless of size. So you'd think like, oh, a small pink or, you know, a two-year-old chum would just be well, a little snack and they just choke that down and move on and not, not bother um, sharing it. But uh, there's a really good paper uh, by John Ford and Graham Ellis out of, uh, I'm trying to remember which, I think it's Marine Ecology Progress Series, but I can't quite remember, 2006. Um, and they looked at that. They looked at fish size and whether that um, impacted sharing behavior and it, and it didn't. So the, the social um, function of sharing behavior, I think is important regardless of what kind of calories you're giving away. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, we have a question here from Jenny asking, um, how often do the click sequences warn the prey of the whale's presence and could this affect capture success? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so there isn't a ton of information out there on uh, fish hearing for the, this species, particularly for Chinook salmon. Um, there's some information uh, from Atlantic salmon and a couple of other species of salmon. And the indication is that salmon have fairly poor hearing. 
especially in the range of the echolocation clicks. So salmon hear at very low frequencies and the evidence suggests that they can't hear um, echolocation clicks. Um, and it makes sense based on um, Volker's previous work with transients versus residents and transients hardly echolocate at all when they're hunting because they're searching for prey that can hear them, seals and sea lions and other dolphins. Um, but residents echolocate all the time um, and they don't really seem to be that concerned about alerting prey. So definitely prey must sense at some point that they're being chased, um, but I'm not sure if that's water pressure or electroreception or, or how exactly they're sensing it, but the echolocation clicks themselves, no, the, the indication is that they can't hear them. Makes sense. Uh, okay, Eric is wondering, um, do these tags allow for analysis of changes in signaling when vicinity of vessel traffic, both uh, echolocation and other types of signaling? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's sort of one of their um, main strengths and uh, direction of a lot of research is that you're picking up all these environmental sounds and um, the received level of the sound at the whale's location. Um, and then you know, what it may do in response. So there's a lot of uh, DTAG studies out there looking at military sonar and what that does to beaked whale um, dive behavior, things like that. Um, personally, I'd like to use it for, <laughs> for vessel, uh, vessel responses and things like that and see how that impacts application, foraging, behavior states. Um, and also there's great work out of NOAA and killer whales doing this too. Okay, awesome. We have a question from Dom Tollett um, oh, asking, hey, uh, asking um, when considering vessel noise click masking impacts, um, would you consider the greater risk is during the shallow search phase, assuming salmon are at greater ranges during this phase and hence weaker click echo returns or more during the deeper pursuit phase? Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know enough about the acoustics of sound prop. Acoustics is actually not really my expertise. I ended up doing some acoustic work for this project, but it's really my first foray into acoustics. So I could imagine that the search phase might be really important um, just because they are trying to detect things super far away and the, the echoes may be fainter and, and easily masked. Um, that would be the guess I would hazard, but I really, it's not really my focus area, so I, I couldn't really say for sure, but that's that's what I would guess. Um, great. Someone, Yuri mentioned that um, salmons do have a lateral line, and so potentially the echolocation could, they could be detecting the echolocation through that lateral line. I don't know yeah, if absolutely. There thoughts could be on some that electroreception going on there. And um, interestingly enough, I also found a paper that uh, implied that, I think it was Guiana dolphins, but that cetaceans potentially have an ability to electro, electrically sense uh, the fields that their prey produce. Um, so there's some sort of indication that, I don't know if killer whales can do that. That would be really interesting to know, especially because when they're pursuing prey, they didn't always echolocate, but they were still at depths where they couldn't see anything. So what are they following? Are they following some sort of electrical sense of where that prey is based on that lateral line? Or are they hearing passive swimming sounds from the fish's tail going back and forth? I'm not sure. So there's a lot of mystery still there. Great. Um, Jerry Clemen is says, very nice presentation. Um, with the DTAG orientation reversed with the taper in the back, does this shorten the time the tag will stay on because of more drag? So tag orientation yeah. and drag. And yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, ideally we want it pointed with the antenna going backwards. Uh, the, the antenna is for VHF, so it's for actually retrieving the tag. It's not actually collecting any information. It's just so that we can follow the whale while it's tagged and, and eventually pick up the tag afterwards. Um, so if tags happen to go on the wrong way, um, or which happen, happen sometimes, but when more often they, they go on the right way and then they migrate um, because of the water pressure, or the whale does a breach and lands on the tag. And so we, we had tags that, you know, 
went on great and then spun sideways or we had one that went around to the belly of the whale so we weren't sure the whole time was it still on the whale or not um so yeah it definitely makes a difference um and drag is definitely increased if that tag is not in that sort of backwards orientation and also in that little pocket by the insertion of the dorsal fin is a really great place because we can hear the VHS signal when the animal comes up and it's also kind of like a low drag area. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, Eric Young has another question, which is, has any work been done to analyze the correlation between echolocation pre-capture and post-capture and other signaling? Uh, in other words, do they talk to each other in a different way during and after captures? Right. Yeah, so I, I really wanted to look at pulsed calls, which are, you know, the stereotyped calls that killer whales make. I really wanted to see how those fit in with um, all of this. The, the trouble with pulsed calls is that there's no good methodology right now to discern whether that call is made by the tag whale or it's made by some other whale with its face in the hydrophone. Um, so we can't really tell who it belongs to and it makes it really hard to infer, you know, why calls are being used or, or how they're being directed. And um, so you heard on that last recording, there's a bunch of excited whistling and, and kind of squealing there. And, uh, and I heard that a couple of times on a couple of different tags, but not always. So it would be really interesting to get at that. Um, but there's just no physical way with that type of sound, um, its characteristics to, to discern if it's a tag well or, or some other conspecific that's just around. Um, and that's just the sound properties, like echolocation because of the properties of it and how, uh, how it's structured. That's why we can use angle of arrival and look at the properties of, of that low frequency energy, but there's just no way with the other sounds. And then we have a follow-up to that, um, which you may have sort of answered, but you can <laughs> say it again. Um, how significant is the difference between sounds that are made for foraging and sounds that are made for communicating with pod mates? How do you compare those pulse calls versus the clicks and things like that? Yeah, I mean, they're quite different. Clicks are, are you know, high amplitude, short duration, um, you know, they sound kind of the same. Like they sound a little different when transients are making them versus residents, but there's no, you know, discernible difference between groups of resident killer whales and echolocation clicks kind of sound the same. Um, but with those, pulse calls or stereotype calls, there's just such a variety and, and they're so predicated on the social grouping and um, social learning of those animals um, that they're just very, very different. Whereas I would guess that echolocation is a little bit like just ingrained genetically that killer whales just know how to make a click. Um, whereas pulse calls and a call repertoire, they have to learn that from the other individuals and um, over time, right? Makes sense. Um, Emily is wondering, did you have any instances where you observed vessel noise interrupting foraging behavior while the D tags were in use? Uh, yeah, we did have uh, occasions where um, vessels were present, um, large vessels and small vessels. We had cruise ships, uh, a lot of small sport fisher boats. Um, I didn't specifically have time to analyze what it did to foraging behavior. Um, we had a lot of instances where it dis disrupted kind of resting behavior. So you'd have a tag on a whale and they'd all be kind of in a nice resting line and really subdued. And then a cruise ship would go through and whales would start breaching and calling and, and just waking up. Um, but that's sort of just anecdotally, I, I didn't analyze any of that. Um, we had someone ask, will this presentation be available to view later? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Um, which is not a question for you, it's a question for me to answer. It's available on the Society for Marine Mammalogy Facebook page, and there'll also be um, the video on our YouTube page, which is available via the SMM website. So yes. Um, okay, another question, um, which I th think we've sort of answered, but well, I'll see it again in a different way. Um, did you observe feeding disruptive behavior with vessels? Yeah, kind of the same thing. So yeah, yeah I mean, the area where we worked is um, killer whales frequented a lot um, and vessels frequented a lot, or at least small vessels uh, specifically. Uh, there's a lot of sport fishing activity and some whale watching, but um, 
a lot of the time when we deployed tags, we tried to do it in the areas where there wasn't a lot of vessel pressure. So it didn't happen, you know, with a great frequency in this location, but it was still present. I just, I didn't do any analysis on exactly what happened. <laughs> yeah. And someone was one, uh, Taryn was wondering, did you observe them consuming any species other than salmon? Uh, not during this study, no, um, but we have instances, uh, somewhat rare instances, but um, in our DFO predation database of them consuming other bony fishes like halibut, herring. Um, yeah, so it does happen, but in this study, no. <laughs> and I think that was just based on the region and the time of year. This is a salmon hotspot and it is their preferred prey. So there's no reason for them to go seeking anything else out. So if folks want to keep asking questions, we do have a, oh, here we go. <laughs> um, did you see a common role um, at capture? Any differences between sex and age? Yeah. Um, some of the, I mean, these are all, again, just anecdotal. I didn't quantify any of this, but um, with males, you see a lot of uh, kind of more solitary foraging where they're kind of off to the side and they're catching fish on their own. You don't see a lot of prey sharing, so they tend to um, come up with a fish and they do what we like to term the victory circle. They sort of bite the fish in half and then one piece kind of falls down into the water and they consume the piece they have and then they kind of circle around and get the other piece. So you'll see this kind of stereotype circling behavior um, that happens after they get a fish. Um, so that was one thing that we did see on the details. You could see these kind of victory circles that we called them as they went and, and, and got their fish. Um, we did see a lot of really um, kind of repetitive, highly successful foraging behavior by mother killer whales. So females with dependent offspring, we'd see like, you know, five kills in a row um, with her bringing them up and sharing all the pieces with the juveniles. Um, and we would see synchronous diving too. So if you had like a a tag on a juvenile, you'd often see uh, the mother would be diving, but then the juvenile would be diving alongside. And that, that probably is something to do with uh, learning how to catch fish and lear learning how to um, do all these behaviors that allow you to be successful as a resident killer whale. Um, so yeah, we did see a bit of that too. Um, Shannon is wondering, can you share one of your most surprising observations or experiences that you had in the field or that you made in the field? Oh, it's a hard one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, surprising. I guess one thing that I felt, well, maybe not surprising, but just challenging is a lot of the data that comes out of these D tags for a lot of other species. Um, it's fairly stereotyped, like you have um, animals that do extreme dives to thousands of meters like beaked whales. So you know what they're doing when they're going on that dive is that they're hunting. And um, then you can analyze that accordingly. Um, and with baleen whales, you get a lot of stereotype behaviors like lunch feeding where you get extreme decelerations that are very obvious on DTAG data. So you can pick those out. And I guess, I guess I thought it would be simpler to pick out resident killer whale feeding than it actually was. Like the feeding behavior exists on such a spectrum that um, yeah, it was sometimes difficult to tell what was foraging and what wasn't. And then, um, yeah, it, it was sometimes a challenge and that was kind of <laughs> different, I guess. Um, Jessica is wondering, um, about this difference on clicks and communication sounds in the recordings you shared with us that were, they were mostly clicks, right? Um, could this mean that they don't communicate much during foraging in this group? Uh, yeah, the, I mean, the, the clips I shared with you were sort of cherry picked to show you one sound at a time um, so that it wasn't confusing, um, but we do hear um, pulse calls and st like stereotyped pulse calls um, when killer whales are foraging too. So they do, they do emit those calls and I mean, presumably that's for keeping in contact with other group members and perhaps for sharing prey and communicating that prey have been caught. Um, they didn't always occur, but they were definitely there for sure. This is hard to indicate which animal it's coming from, if I understand correctly. What yeah, exactly. You just couldn't pinpoint who it was. Yeah. 
Um, Uko is wondering, um, and I know, I think this data was pre-pandemic, but if you've been working with any more acoustic data, um, have you seen or heard differences during the pandemic um, with viewership traffic? Yeah, I actually haven't been uh, doing any uh, acoustic work, but I could imagine it's going to, sorry, my cat is just like going crazy here. Hang on. <laughs> Um, yeah, I can imagine with the uh, with the slowdown, no cruise ships, less fishing charters, less whale watching, all of that. Um, I think it's probably a really good natural experiment. I wish we had been out there um, recording uh, some of this stuff, but yeah, no, not not specifically. I haven't been, but um, I hope others are. So I'll be curious to see what comes out of uh, people's data sets in a couple of years for when data was collected during this time, yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot of studies looking into that in various populations across the world, so. Yeah, we have a lot of passive acoustic hydrophones out, like so moorings that are underwater for a year, picking up, um, you know, whale noises and, and ship noises and stuff. So, so that data could potentially yield some interesting things, but we don't have any tag data for this time period, yeah. Um, well, I'll ask a question on behalf of the students. Um, which is, can you, or any students that might be watching, can you talk a little bit about how you came to be interested in this subject first and sort of how you came to decide, um, you know, you wanted to do a master's and then get into research biology? Yeah, um, so I guess when I was an undergrad, I've always been interested in, in wildlife and, and in biology. Um, and when I was an undergrad, I participated in a co-op uh, work program so I could get kind of a sampling of different jobs that were out there. Um, and one of the first jobs I did was uh, doing telemetry on terrestrial animals um, on bighorn sheep in the Canadian Rockies. And I just found that so interesting um, collecting data and knowing sort of more about what an animal's day-to-day -day routines are and um, the technology that can give you that. And then I also did a work term uh, with John Ford at the Pacific Biological Station. And um, that really got my sort of curiosity peaked on, on killer whales. And um, they weren't a, a group of animals I knew a, t a lot about before I started the work term, um, but I, I just really enjoyed the work and enjoyed the people I was working with and kind of was able to have that leads to you know contract work and then eventually a master's degree and now I work for the group full time so um, yeah it was sort of a lucky circumstances combined with um, just yeah getting to work with some really great people in some really amazing places in the world and yeah and so related to that do you have any advice big question but advice for students who <laughs> might be wanting to get into the kind of research that you're doing yeah, I would say seek out like practical opportunities where you can go and work in the field, but also um, be mentored by people that um, can show you how the ins and outs of data analysis work um, or lab work, if that's your interest. Um, so I guess I would say seek out practical opportunities while you're taking your courses um, so that you can get a sense of, of the things you enjoy and the things you, you maybe less enjoy. Um, I would also say like try and get skill sets in um, coding and statistics, but also try and get skill sets in uh, boat driving and <laughs> uh, anything like that. Like anyone who's willing to kind of mentor you and, and provide that um, sort of contribution to your education outside of uh, university lecture halls is really key. Get as many varied skills as you can that fit within your interests. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and be willing to kind of do the hard work too, you know, like be willing to sit in the boat in the fog and the rain and, and, and be cool with that. <laughs> so. Makes sense. Um, Daryl, do you have any other questions? I don't think I have any uh, further questions. Um, so I guess we, uh, uh, I think I just saw something pop up in the Q&A. So let's double check there. Oh, just a statement uh, from Yuri. So at this point, I guess we will say thank you for an excellent talk, Brianna. Um, good advice to students wanting to get involved. Um, I see a whole lot of praise for your presentation, uh, Brianna. So we really do appreciate it. Um, I put in the chat 
uh, well, a couple things. One, I noticed some comments in the chat about the link to the paper not working. And I, I, it's kind of strange because I reposted it. I have it on um, in a Word file. And when I click on it in the Word file, it goes straight to the paper. I put it in the chat. When I click on it, you get a, an error. So I, I would suggest to people to uh, simply go to Marine Mammal Science, uh, search for your paper. And since it's open access, whether you have a subscription to Marine Mammal Science or not, you'll be able to download the paper if you would like it. So uh, uh, I also put in the chat um, the paper that the uh, next month's seminar will be based on. We actually will have a trilogy of killer whale presentations. This will be the third um, killer whale seminar in a row. Um, I promise after that, for those who would like to hear about something other than killer whales, uh, we will have a seminar on something not killer whale. Um, so with that, uh, I think maybe we'll go ahead and sign off. Thank you all for uh, attending uh, this great presentation, and hopefully we'll have you join in uh, next month. It will be, I believe, same third, what is it, third Thursday um, of the month. Um, not sure the exact time, so double check um, the website for uh, posting of the time. With that, thank you very much. Yeah, watch much. your email for the <laughs> registration link. Okay. Thanks, Daryl. Thanks, Teresa. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Bye-bye, everybody.